Good evening. Welcome to the first in our 17 programs for January and February at the Pratt Library. Writers Live series, thanks for coming out this evening. A um, couple things, a couple notes of housekeeping. Uh, Michael and Julian are gonna speak for about 45 minutes and then take your questions. We have a microphone there, and there will be a microphone there. If you could bring the questions, even though we're intimate tonight, bring the questions to the mic, we'd appreciate it. That way our audience back home that's watching online can hear the question. After the event, uh, the Ivy Bookshop is outside. Please purchase a book from our local book selling partner, and Michael and Julian will be willing to sign it for you. Uh, if you haven't been here before, welcome. Uh, if you haven't been here in a year, welcome. Uh, we have free parking at the Franklin Street Garage. I say, I've been saying this for eight months. I'll keep saying it until someone tells me to stop. Um, parking is an issue in Baltimore like any city, but here it seems to be far more of a priority for people who don't want to go out. So now we have free parking. There's no reason why you can't come here and have parking free one block from here. Beautiful. And then finally, you're here for this program. So you're obviously interested in history and social sciences. Next Thursday, Clint Smith is going to be joining us for How the Word is Passed. It's his book on the legacy of slavery in America. And then on January 19th, the following week, uh, Kadeda Williams will be coming. She's a professor who looks at, uh, her book is called I Saw Death Coming, and it's a new book on Reconstruction. So two history books that I think would be of interest to anyone who attends this program. And with that, tonight I'm happy to welcome Julian Zelzer and Michael Kazin to the Pratt Library to discuss Myth America, historians take on the biggest legends and lies about our past. A collection of historical scholarship that dismantles the myths and political opportunism that has recently cast a pall over America's historical landscape. Julian Zelzer, the co-editor of the book, is a Princeton University history professor and the author or editor of numerous titles, including Burning Down the House, Newt Gingrich and the Rise of the New Republican Party. He is also a CNN political analyst and a regular guest at NPR's Here and Now. This evening, he's joined in conversation by Michael Kazin, a contributor to the book and a history professor at Georgetown University. Michael is the author of several books, including his most recent, What It Took to Win, A History of the Democratic Party. In his review of the book, Pulitzer Prize-winning author David Blight wrote, Myth America's contributors take direct aim at the lies that are the lifeblood of the myths that grip American culture and politics today. This book is a collective work of courage in a time when truth and facts have never been so widely abused. And Yale University history professor Beverly Gage called the book an extraordinary essay collection by an extraordinary group of historians, each determined to make our nat national history usable in all the best ways. The truth, truth does exist, and they tell it well. Together, they make an indispensable intervention uh, for our troubled times. It is my great pleasure to welcome Julian Zelzer and Michael Kays into the Pratt Library. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, live streaming and everyone in the uh, audience. We're really happy to be here. Today's the release of the book, um, which is always exciting. So uh, I'm here, and one of our great authors uh, has joined us as well. We're going to speak a little bit about the book, um, uh, our thoughts on uh, kind of what's going on in our understanding of history uh, and how we should do history and think about history in such a political age. And then we want to open it up for questions and uh, answers. And so the, the book comes out, Myth America, um, at, at a moment when there's disinformation everywhere. Uh, we are in a, a period for sure where the filters have disappeared in many public uh, forums where uh, it's very hard to ascertain um, what's, what's true and, and what's not. And uh, my co-editor, Kevin Cruz, and I wanted to put it together a book that tackled some of the big questions uh, in history that are relevant to public debates that we have today. And we were both frustrated, as many of our authors were, that often you hear things uh, circulating uh, uh, in the media about the past that are totally disconnected from what generations of scholars have been writing about. Um, and uh, in, in 2022, 2023, there's two kind of major ways in which we think this is happening. One is social media 
has really uh, opened up uh, the arena and made it much more difficult um, without guardrails to control what kinds of conversations are taking place in history. And as a result, you uh, have kind of this spread of, of knowledge that uh, is not particularly helpful uh, if we want a serious evaluation of the past. And we do argue that although uh, you can find inaccuracies in history on the left and the right, it's become more pronounced in recent years as an asymmetry, as social scientists say, in conservative media in particular, where you have a lot of um, public figures, amateur historians, pundits, uh, who sell books uh, very well, who are on air all the time, uh, and whose ideas have really filtered through. And so we wanted to uh, ask some of the great historians of this country to write short, punchy essays. Many of them are people who appear in social media or they appear on television. But instead of the short 30-second soundbite, which I myself am guilty of, uh, or instead of the tweet of however many words, to ask people like Michael Kazin to expand a bit, uh, to write essays that are accessible and uh, easy to digest, uh, but which bring together really what we know on, on uh, several topics that, that I'll talk about. And, and myths about American history, whether they are just lies about the past or misleading information, are very problematic. I mean, obviously, at some level, we want the most rigorous understanding of the United States that we have. We want debates that are grounded in fact rather than debates that are not uh, unhinged uh, from, from what we know. These debates sometimes influence uh, discussions of public policy today. We have a couple essays in the book, for example, on the impact that uh, government programs have made. And uh, two of our authors, Eric Rauschway and Joshua Zeitz, one studying the New Deal, one studying the Great Society, challenge an idea that's become quite pervasive, that these were monumental failures uh, that didn't really uh, have an impact on employment in the 1930s or social safety programs in the 1960s. Uh, and they become the basis of, of a lot of very important discussions outside of history, whether it's discussions about education, which has become very politicized in um, recent years or discussions of public policy. Uh, there, history wars are not new. We point that out in our introduction. It's not as if this is the first era we've lived in where history becomes very politicized uh, and there are um, kind of controversies over how we treat history. Uh, we point out, uh, for example, in 1995, there was a big debate uh, in Washington uh, when the Smithsonian was going to commemorate the 50th anniversary um, of the bombing of Hiroshima uh, with an exhibit of the Enola Gay, which was the um, B-29 bomber that, that carried out the mission. And there was a debate uh, between historians and uh, curators and uh, military organizations about what should be included in that. And it really blew up. It became a public controversy with historians arguing that uh, the exhibit really needed to show the impact um, of the bombing on Japan and, and the brutality of, of what happened. There were military organizations saying that they were trying to present an equivalency if they did this between the United States and Japan. It became a big controversy in the mid-1990s. There were debates in the 90s um, when many historians were kind of questioning, um, uh, you know, uh, how we study facts and, and should history be told as one story after another, or is there more subjectivity in how we interpret what happened? Uh, there was a book called Telling the Truth About History by three very prominent historians who put these kinds of questions on the table. This also became a big debate. Um, about whether historians were moving too far into postmodernism and subjectivity. There were debates in the 90s about education in, in uh, elementary schools and even in college. Uh, the first Bush administration, George H.W. Bush, uh, pushed the um, uh, kind of uh, basically standards, wanted uh, certain standards um, in, in the history curricula. And this became a big debate. What were these standards about? Were you trying to 
basically tell one story of history that was triumphant uh, and that was very celebratory, ignoring what a lot of academics in the university were writing about the impact of race and sexism and imperialism uh, on, on the US past. So uh, in, in some ways, this is a continuation of controversies that I know Mike will talk more about these that we've had, but in some ways it's different. And I think the things I said at the beginning make it a little different in that we're not always having a debate about how to interpret what happened. We are now in a realm where often you're hearing a debate about just what happened, meaning um, some of the basic data that we know about is often being ignored. I tell my students that in the 60s, you know, you had debates about whether we should be in Vietnam. Should we withdraw from Vietnam? Should we send more troops? Today, if we had that debate, it would be like, is Vietnam even happening? Uh, <laughs> and there would be kind of a conversation about that. And I think that makes it qualitatively different. And it uh, created some of the urgency that a lot of the historians uh, in this book had uh, to, to share, to share what they know and to share what scholarship um, has, has done. And, um, and I think they're successful. I'm obviously a co-editor, so I'm going to boast about the essays. Uh, but they do a really good job. We have one essay, for example, um, by a terrific historian of immigration, Erica Lee, who's at Harvard University, who challenges the idea of immigrants just coming to the United States. You often hear we're being flooded with immigrants. They're coming in here, uh, you know, seeking uh, benefit, and they're overwhelming our system. And she writes a really great, again, short essay about how the drive for immigration often was from within the United States, often from the business community, and really challenging that whole narrative about immigrants just coming as opposed to the way in which we pull in immigrants as a kind of pretty vital part of American history. Another historian, um, Jerry uh, Cadova, wrote a book, uh, essay on the border, and he challenges the idea that you often hear of the border as just a dangerous place of crime, of of death and violence. And he kind of shows in the history of many of these border towns, they're very vibrant. They're sources of commerce and great community uh, and intercultural interaction. I mentioned Eric Rauschway wrote a uh, essay on, and I'm just picking some of the uh, essays in the book on the New Deal, uh, going against the argument that it was World War II which got us out of the depression, as opposed to FDR's New Deal programs, and he shows, no, in fact, the New Deal decreased unemployment. It had immense economic effects uh, before World War II ever uh, started. Um, Glenda Gilmore, a historian at Yale, challenges the idea that you often hear uh, of a distinction between the good civil rights protests and the more uh, kind of radical civil rights protests of recent years, and she shows it's much more messy than that. And she shows how leaders like Martin Luther King were considered fundamentally radical at the time um, when they were governing, that there wasn't always this neat distinction between protests that just involved nonviolent marching and protests that addressed policing and other sorts of, of urban issues. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and Michael has a terrific essay that takes on one of the big arguments that there is no socialism in the United States, which has been a question the left and the right have both <laughs> talked about, but actually um, recovers the way in which socialism actually has a, a history in the United States in local politics and national politics, uh, especially in the progressive era, which is one of his specialties. And some of the ideas ultimately um, filtered into major party politics. Um, so, that's the kind of myth busting uh, we do. Um, David Bell, uh, a historian of France, um, looks at the idea of American exceptionalism, which you hear a lot about, as he points out, Newt Gingrich would talk about this a lot. The idea that the United States is fundamentally different from all other countries, that we are free of the problems uh, that have um, uh, kind of shaped European politics. And he uh, historicizes that idea. And he also shows it's just not very useful uh, in, in thinking about the United States. Understanding the commonalities and similarities in many ways is a better, um, better framework. And there's many more, uh, many more essays in the book that I'm happy to talk about um, during the questions and answers. One of the things 
that we imagined putting this together. Um, again, we, we found uh, public facing historians. That's the term these days. Uh, meaning, I guess, historians who write for uh, people who are not just historians uh, and beyond the classroom. Um, but, but to show uh, that there could be bridges between the academy and the university and the public that I think um, has become more difficult in, in recent years, in part as the universities and the classrooms have become so politicized. But we wanted to you know, showcase these historians who are doing such relevant work and who can synthesize scholarship of many decades uh, into these very compelling and and important uh, arguments. Um, my co-author wrote uh, uh, an essay on the Southern strategy, which if you watch a lot of conservative media, uh, often um, uh, you know, they say there was no Southern strategy, meaning there was no uh, effort by Republicans, the Republican party to gradually win over Southern white votes as the Democratic party um, became more enmeshed in civil rights and, and embraced civil rights after the 1960s. And Kevin uh, is showing that if you read what academics have been writing, and there's tons of evidence, even from memos from Republicans themselves, this is just not, it's not true. The Southern strategy was a well thought out, deliberate um, political agenda uh, that has been going on even before Nixon, uh, really goes back to Eisenhower and even earlier earlier than that. Um, and the point there is some of this shouldn't even be a surprise. Like a lot of historians, I think, will read some of this and they'll be very familiar with it. Um, but there's this disconnect we now live with, um, which is unfortunate um, between these uh, producers of knowledge and, um, and the national conversation. Uh, I'll, I'll end before turning it over to Michael. Um, by saying, I think a lot about what historians do well. I have an article, if anyone's interested, it came out today in the Atlantic where I look back at my career and, and try to talk about things historians I don't think always do well, including myself, uh, the kinds of arguments you make when you're in front of a camera, like saying something's unprecedented is a favorite. Uh, and, and sometimes it's true, but it's one of the most overused phrases and often kind of skews our understanding of what's going on in a period and you miss the roots of what's happening. Um, but one of the things historians do really well, in my opinion, is they just provide kind of a long continuum, a long view, contextual view for understanding uh, what's going on today. Uh, and in fact, they take you out of looking at four year presidential moments, or they take you out of just looking at an explosion of protest that's taking place in a given month or given year. And, and you look back, it could be decades, it could be centuries, and really good historians um, give you that framework, that long view framework for understanding a little bit more about what's happening today. And, and I think the essays in the book really generally succeed uh, in doing that. So in some ways it's, it's an attempt not just to explode myths that we have, which are not good to have, but it's also to showcase um, what I think uh, historians can really offer um, as we have these conversations in future years. So uh, now Michael will share some thoughts. Um, thanks for coming uh, to this beautiful library. And um, it's a real honor to uh, you know, been asked by um, Kevin and Julian to be part of this book. Um, I um, have great respect for the other historians in the book. And as Julian said, I think it's really important that academic historians uh, not just talk to other academic historians, that we uh, share our knowledge and our points of view uh, with um, Americans more generally. And one of the things that struck me in recent years, you probably heard that academic history is not doing so well in terms of numbers. We have fewer uh, majors, uh, fewer grad students, not that many jobs teaching uh, history. Uh, those have shrunk. But Americans care deeply about history. Uh, after. Uh, President Trump left office, he's about to leave office, at least, I guess just right after he left office, um, after his, um, uh, uh, that's the thing that happened on January 6th, you probably heard about, uh, uh, there was a 7076 commission he put together, which was intended to teach the true story of American history. And in fact, uh, only one historian was on the commission, and the history they taught was a history that, um, 
was not really a history, it was propaganda. Uh, it was a story about America as conservatives would like to believe it, at least some conservatives. Uh, conservatives who don't know much history would like to believe it, that everything uh, in America was perfect at the beginning, uh, America's all deeply religious, uh, and uh, things went wrong uh, when Americans began to criticize what was going on. And they're sure there were problems like the Civil War, but they were handled you know, with not much really fuss and bother after a certain number of people died. And generally, the only people who steered it wrong were liberals and people on the left. Um, and, uh, and that was a kind of public facing history. Uh, it didn't go very far, uh, luckily. Then the 1619 Project, which got a lot more attention, uh, which um, actually Kevin Cruz wrote an article for uh, the original volume, maybe the uh, one that's in bookstores now as well. Um, that aroused a lot of controversy as well. Controversy is not a bad thing, but the key thing is that historians who teach in universities should be sharing their knowledge, their points of view, uh, should be involved in arguments about the past. And this book, I hope, will arouse a lot of arguments. I noticed today it's already 45 on Amazon, uh, which is impressive for a book of uh, essays by uh, mostly academic historians. But so we don't shy away from the controversy. The question is, as, as uh, Julian, uh, I think, stated quite well, is you have to know the facts. You have to be true to the facts. And then interpretations of the facts can be quite different. But you can't say something uh, didn't happen if it did. You can't say something did happen if it didn't. Um, one example, and I'll talk about my essay and then make a few uh, comments more, more generally about how to understand American history in a very immodest way. Um, my essay is, is, as Julian mentioned, is entitled American Socialism. Uh, in the essay, what I, tr what I try to do is not to argue something which is not true, that America's had a massive socialist movement or socialist party, uh, which has you know, been a major competitor for political power, because that's just not true. Uh, the largest percentage that a socialist running for president as a socialist uh, ever got was in 1912 when Eugene V. Debs, a former union leader, got 6% of the vote uh, running for president in a four-way uh, race in 1912. Uh, there were three um, other candidates, two Democrat, a Republican, and a progressive, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, running uh, um, on a third-party ticket. Um, but to argue, as Republicans often know, as, as some conservative historians do, that socialism is un-American, that has nothing to do with American history, that socialists have always been spurned by almost all Americans. Um, this is something which uh, began to be popular, this point of view began to be popular during the Cold War, when socialism meant the tyranny of the Soviet Union, and it was a tyranny. And uh, even though I'm a person on the left, I'm very glad the Soviet Union fell apart. What's happened since, different question. But nevertheless, um, clearly uh, the Soviet Union was not the kind of socialism that any, uh, hardly any, most American socialists uh, who were democratic socialists would have um, uh, cheered or tried to emulate. Uh, but democratic socialism, a socialism of people who believe that wealth should be more equally distributed, who believe workers should have more power, uh, who believed uh, that uh, there should be equal rights for all, uh, regardless of gender, immigrant background, uh, or race, uh, is something which actually has very deep roots in American society. And I begin the essay with an anecdote that uh, will probably surprise some people. It's about the man who actually popularized the term socialism, a guy named Robert Owen, who ironically was himself a capitalist, <laughs> uh, an industrialist, born in Wales, and um, built a very successful textile industry in Scotland. Uh, but he began to believe uh, that he was not treating his work as well, that it'd be much better if all goods were held in common. Uh, he wrote a lot of books about this and essays about this. At one point, his essays and his ideas were popular enough in the 1820s that he was invited to come to the United States and um, speak to a joint session of Congress uh, as a socialist. Um, someone who just basically you know, invented the term. Um, and he spoke to Congress. He, got, uh, he spoke a couple of times, uh, giving long talks about his ideas of, of socialism. Uh, the outgoing president of the United States, this was 1824, the outgoing president of the United States, James Monroe, stopped by to give a listen. The incoming president of the United States, John Quincy Adams, also stopped by to give a listen. Uh, there were two living president, former presidents of the United States, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were too ill to come, so he visited them, one in Massachusetts and one in Virginia. So 
here's a uh, sort of irony on top of ironies. Here's a, a, a successful capitalist who converted himself to what we'd call socialism, uh, who was popular enough, at least people interested enough in his thinking about an alternative to this market society which was developing in America, that he was invited to speak to a joint session of Congress, and all four living presidents heard a little bit of what he was saying. Um, and I go on in the essay to talk about how socialists in various ways, uh, never quite as prominent venues as those uh, that they spoke to, but nevertheless uh, were important uh, 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 movers in various uh, social insurgencies and social movements. Uh, the labor movement was begun in this country in a major way in the late 19th century by socialists, including Samuel Gompers, who at the time was a socialist who founded the American Federation of Labor. Um, socialists were very active in the Black Freedom Movement. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, said privately uh, that he thought some kind of socialism, democratic socialism, would be a very good idea for America. Um, uh, he, was, he read Karl Marx when he was in seminary uh, and, and liked a lot of what Marx wrote, even though he was not a Marxist. He was always a Christian socialist, of course, not an uh, um, a atheistic socialist. Uh, there were very important figures in other ways. Uh, the man who really kind of invented the idea of uh, a war on poverty was, a, was the leading socialist in America in the 1950s and 60s named Michael Harrington, um, who wrote a book called uh, The Other America. Anybody ever read that book? Uh, it was really a, uh, at a time of widespread general prosperity in America, late 1950s and 1960s, Harrington wrote a very well-researched book about how many poor people there were in America, uh, of all races, um, and a very deep investigation of that. It got a lot of attention, and uh, John Kennedy, when he was president, uh, Read, a, read the book and had advisors who read the book, and he decided partly uh, on the basis of reading Harrington's book, this leading American socialist, to launch the war on poverty. Uh, and Lyndon Johnson, of course, carried it on uh, to a certain degree after Kennedy's assassination. Uh, also, there were socialists elected to more than a thousand local offices, uh, as Julian said, in the early 20th century when the Socialist Party was very strong. Um, and very pro there were prominent uh, individuals who we don't think about being socialists, who were very much uh, articulate, uh, articulated their socialist beliefs in a very out front way, wrote articles about it. Um, so I don't have to jog my, my aging memory. Let's mention some of their names, um, which will be familiar to, to all of you, um, who were people who, who were very friendly to the idea of socialism and often um, actually joined a socialist group, a socialist party. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walter Lippmann, John Dewey, W.B. Du Bois, Jack London, Carl Sandburg, Upton Sinclair, Theodore Dreiser, all these books are in the library here, of course, <laughs> Helen Keller, John Reed, Eugene O'Neill, Randolph Bourne, Florence Kelly, Isidore Duncan, Thorstein Veblen, I'm sorry, I'm giving this, <laughs> you a lot of work here to do with the names, Walter Rauschenbusch, Clarence Darrow, Max Eastman, George Bellows, Charlie Chaplin, Ernest Hemingway, John Steinbeck, Orson Welles, Norman Mailer, Woody Guthrie, and the great painter Jacob Lawrence. Um, These are just some of the figures who were inspired by the ideas of socialism, the ideas of a greater equality and greater democracy in America and around the world. Some joined socialist parties, some supported socialist candidates, some just made clear in their writings, in their creativity, in their art, uh, uh, that they were in favor of some kind of socialism. Um, so socialism then has been an important tendency in American life, really since there has been a term, socialism, which as I said, was invented basically, or at least actually popularized by this uh, industrialist uh, named uh, Robert Owen from, from Great Britain. Uh, so there's an old argument, as Julian knows very well, that he made reference to it in his remarks about why has there never been a major socialist party in America? Uh, and that's an important question, and I address that to some degree in the, uh, in the essay. But it's never less important to realize that you can have influence without having a uh, political institution uh, you call your own. Uh, and in, many ways the, you know, in some ways, the best example of that uh, politically is a guy you probably heard of named Bernie Sanders, who all his life has called himself a socialist. He was elected as a socialist to be mayor of Burlington, Vermont, he was elected as a socialist to be a congressman from Vermont. He was elected as a socialist to be senator from Vermont. <coughs> and then he decided he wanted to run for president in 2015. So of course he knew 
if he was going to get anywhere, he couldn't run as a socialist because we have a two-party system and it's very difficult to make, uh, you know, get many votes and get power running for a third party. So he ran as a Democrat and he almost beat Hillary Clinton in the primaries. He came close to beating Joe Biden in the primaries without changing his beliefs, without saying anything different than he had ever said throughout his whole career. Uh, but he did so as a Democrat and began to recruit a lot of young people to see themselves as well. If Bernie Sanders is a socialist, maybe socialism is not a bad idea. Maybe it doesn't mean, you know, Russian tanks uh, going into Prague uh, or Chinese tanks r running down protests in, in Tiananmen Square. Maybe it means, you know, um, health care for all, housing for all, uh, higher minimum wage, uh, make it easier to join unions, um, serious equal rights for people of color, um, and other reforms as well. Uh, so I think in that sense, Jerry Sanders is a very good example of the kind of thing I talk about in the essay. Uh, somebody who has socialist ideas, has socialist ideas, doesn't call them anything but socialism, but understands that if you're gonna affect American life, American society with your um, ideas, you've gotta be part of the mainstream of American life. And you can't demand a revolution. You can't demand uh, that only working in the socialist party is gonna get you anywhere. Um, so in this sense, it goes against, I quote in the beginning of the essay, several um, uh, conservatives, politicians, uh, including Donald Trump, who said, remember one of his State of the Union addresses, he said, America will never be a socialist country. Um, and other uh, politicians said, well, of course, no Americans will ever identify with this crazy idea. Well, the point of the essay is not that America has ever been close to being a socialist country, that's not true. But a lot of the reforms, a lot of the creativity that we prize, even many non-socialist prize, would be, have been impossible without people who consider themselves to be socialists. So that's the point of the essay. A um, Couple general remarks, and then I'll you know, uh, we'll open up for questions, or we can go back and forth too, uh, depending on what uh, questions folks have. larger point about American history that I like to make, to make to my students, and I think it's important when we're talking, uh, as we are with this, I think, very impressive book um, about how to understand American history. Um, you know, I, I see American history as a conflict between social forces who are in many ways agree on one thing, that the ideals of America are great ideals. You know, the ideals of equality and democracy, the ideals of individual freedom, uh, in the Bill of Rights, uh, uh, the ideals in the founding documents, despite the fact that, you know, as we know, uh, they were written uh, um, by m m many of the people who wrote them were uh, either enslavers or were politicians who were indebted to uh, enslavers. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they rose above their interests to, to put forth great enlightenment ideals about freedom and democracy and equality, which I think are inspiring ideals still today. Uh, the question is how you apply those ideals. The question is how Americans in the past have applied those ideals. Can we be empathetic understanding how those who supported segregation and those who uh, supported black freedom both thought they were applying those ideals in their own ways? They really did. You know, to me, that's doing it history. It's not doing it history to argue, <clears throat> on the one hand, as the 1776 Project did, America's a great country except for those terrible, traitorous liberals and leftists. Uh, or to argue as uh, the most popular leftist historian has ever written, ever lived, Howard Zinn uh, argues, that America has basically been a country in which the ruling class, the elite, has brainwashed the large majority, except for a few uh, uh, really rebellious, heroic radicals um, who were able to rise above that brainwashing, somehow cleanse their brains of this terrible brainwashing they were getting from the, uh, from the elite. Uh, to me, both those points of view are, are wrong-headed because neither of them really tries very hard to understand this conflict between social forces, between different activists on right and left and also in the center, uh, arguing about really basic questions about how America should be ruled, who should have power, uh, what they should do with that power. To me, that's really what doing history is about and what I think uh, the articles in this um, great anthology are about. So. Uh, the argument between, unfortunately, it's often typed as right and left today, uh, because you know conservatives tend to uphold this celebratory view of American history, and the left sometimes is, I think, characterized unfairly for the most part as upholding, you know, uh, again, American history is just one tale of ruin and 
and, and uh, discrimination and racism and, um, and class exploitation uh, all the time. Uh, I think an argument about you know, what's really going on in America, which is more complex than either of these ideological camps would have it, is a really important uh, debate to have. Because we who are either citizens of this country or people who come to this country as immigrants and like to be citizens and want to stay here and value the country for various reasons, I think have to dive deep into the history as much as they have time for to really um, to honor American history is to embrace that complexity and to embrace those conflicts and to embrace uh, uh, the actual facts of what went on and not to be beholden to one you know, ideological um, predisposition or another. Um, so uh, I think that's what both of us try to do in our history uh, and what the uh, other writers uh, in this anthology try to do. And uh, I'd be curious what you uh, like to know about um, or comments you'd like to make about what we've said. So we are uh, gonna take Q&A, although we can also uh, have a conversation, but um, I don't know online, in person, how you wanna handle Other questions? There are. Yeah. Good. Uh, so if you had a question, Please stand up, get off the mic. Um, but I do have uh, the first question from the online audience. Uh, in the hopes of, a, of a, in the hopes of abstaining from the use of the word unprecedented, is our current era of historical and political falsehoods a unique time in American history? Uh, no. So um, <laughs> look. So if if someone was talking about the former president Donald Trump, there is a way to, as the Washington Post like to do, they would literally have a running list of lies, mistruths, It got to be 3,000, I think. It was like 3,000. So you can make an argument that here in presidential politics, sure, we've had presidents who say things that are uh, lies or not true, but here you have someone who did it with a frequency and comfort that was unprecedented. That said, that's an example for me. A presidential line is, is not new. And there's big presidential lies. I've written a lot about Lyndon Johnson and you know, the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, the alleged attacks that take place, which become the basis for one of the most catastrophic wars we have had. It's a big lie uh, or a big mistruth. George W. Bush and the weapons of mass destruction that became the basis of his presidential um, uh, conflict uh, war in, in Iraq is, is another example. And those are two related to war. Uh, we could kind of rattle off lots of this. I have another, another one, uh, Woodrow yeah. Wilson, um, right. who, uh, you know, a, a, a great progressive president in, in some ways, but also a great racist president, uh, whose father was um, a, a Presbyterian minister and was very pro-Confederacy. And uh, um, Wilson wrote, uh, he was actually the only American president with a PhD. Uh, he was in political science, not history, but he wrote, he wrote uh, several volume popular history of the United States, in which he put forth a very much pro-Dixiecrat, uh, um, pro-slavery in effect, uh, point of view about American history. And, and infamously, uh, when he was in the White House, he uh, allowed uh, this infamous, uh, but unfortunately brilliantly made film, Birth of a Nation, by D.W. Griffith, shown in the White House, one right. of the first films shown in the White House. And he made very clear, he thought the Ku Klux Klan might have gone overboard uh, in some of their terrorism against uh, black people uh, trying to vote uh, in the South and uh, exercise their rights as citizens after the Civil War. But, you know, it probably was necessary to uh, put the, the good people of the South, that is, the good white people of the South, back in power. And this was, you know, uh, ironically or <laughs> infamously, the only uh, president we ever had who has a PhD. And he was a, a very respected historian. In fact, in Birth of a Nation, uh, which was a silent film, uh, some of the titles, I guess they're called, you know, yeah. interspersed in the film, quote from Woodrow Wilson's history uh, of the United States. So that's another and example then, of presence. At the yeah. public level, too. I mean, the conspiracy theory and, um, you know, misinformation is not new. Uh, you can study the Cold War and uh, you can study McCarthyism. You can look at the historian Richard Hofstadter who wrote about the anti-intellectual tradition and in conspiracy theories. This is always there. So uh, on the one hand, you can say this is a version or uh, kind of part of American political culture that we've seen from up high at the presidential level to the mass level. But then you can also ask questions of what has changed. And so I started by talking about how has public communication changed in ways that are different 
um, and I do believe social media is an example, in some ways, because of the reach of social media, because of how filterless uh, it is, uh, creates an atmosphere where things that have happened often and things that have been part of the past can spread much more quickly, they can spread much more easily um, than they have in the past. And so that's how you can kind of think of a problem like that question is pointing to without doing the kind of reflexive uh, unprecedented and, and, and ask it in a different way that I think is more useful. Other questions? Um, to piggyback off of that, you've referenced historical events or figures where misinformation has been very popular. Um, you've cited how just it's changed from social media. From a historical perspective, what are the long-term effects for what we're facing now compared to the impact it had, say, in the Cold War or before information could spread so fast? I mean, I'll, 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 I'll take the, the first stab at that. Um, it's a quick question. <clears throat> it's a very good question. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I think um, there's less push. It's harder to push back. That's kind of an instinctive answer uh, I have, meaning uh, obviously there are problems when um, uh, media or uh, mechanisms of information were very controlled or there were more guardians at the gate, uh, whether what's going to be published in the newspaper, what will be said at the presidential uh, level was more guarded. There were problems with that, um, but there was more pushback on the rest of this stuff. It wasn't as easy just to get, I, I couldn't just say something right here, get it on so History is everywhere, and um, I think that's a good thing. I mean, yes, of course, I don't want people to believe in conspiracy yeah. theories, but at the same time, it shows they really care. Uh, and so it used to be history was interpreted mostly in lecture halls and seminars and you know, sometimes newspapers and magazines, but now it's everywhere. You know, people are, as Julian said, people are battling about it you know, in the PTA, you know, uh, which um, when I grew up in the 1960s, that wasn't true. I don't remember any battles about history in the PTA. Uh, at least my mother didn't tell me about them anyway. Um, but uh, so in some ways, that's a good thing. I mean, you can have arguments with, with people, um, you know, just in, around, uh, around American life, you know, in various institutions in America about history because, you know, they, they care about it. And that's, that's a good thing, I think, um, actually. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think, uh, as Julian said, there, there's lots of examples of... Um, suppression of uh, debate about history in the past. Uh, for example, during the Cold War um, in a state like California, which was not then a progressive uh, ruled state by any means, you had to take a loyalty oath to be a, a college teacher. Uh, I think a high school teacher as well, but certainly be a college teacher. My first job uh, when I was in grad school teaching was at San Francisco State University. And uh, you're supposed to sign a loyalty oath even back then, this was in the 1970s. Uh, you didn't have to, nobody actually enforced it, but it's still on the books. One of the good things about that, however, was that 
uh, they wanted a lot of people to teach American history, to teach the history about America as a great country. So that meant a lot of people like me got jobs teaching American history, might otherwise have not gotten jobs teaching American history. Um, but there was, there were the American Legion and other conservative groups did have groups, they had an Americanism committee, which took, uh, went around to various colleges and some high schools too, checking on curriculum and uh, getting some people in trouble for, for teaching um, history that, that they thought was not pro-American enough. And there were members of the Communist Party and people who, who were considered members of the Communist Party lost their jobs no matter what history they were teaching just because of that, of that background. So um, what's gonna happen in the future? You know, the great thing about being a historian is you don't have to uh, explain the future. You know, it's hard enough to explain the past, but um, I think um, that whatever happens to academic history, I think America is gonna still care about history very deeply uh, because once you think the past matters, you never quite lose that that, that idea, you know, you never quite lose the idea that it really matters to you. And I think, you know, we have people in churches arguing about history. You have people in, um, uh, in uh, obviously, schools arguing about history. You have people in every institution now arguing about history. Uh, and so that's one of, the, one of the things I hope for, for this book is people pick this up and say, you know, I don't have to read a whole book about this, but here's 12 pages right. about something which I know is controversial. Maybe we should all read this together in our PTA or in our reading group or something like that. You know, we have to read the whole book, and you know, we want people to read the whole book. But you know, you make a copy of that chapter. It's okay. <laughs> you know, um, uh, make sure you tell people to read the whole book. But uh, you know, that could be really useful. Um, I think. And debates about history. I mean, this is, I think, uh, the same gist. It, they're good. I mean, good debates are incredibly useful and exciting. I, this book isn't meant to be the definitive history of all these subjects. They're, in fact, kind of smart, fun essays that should open up debate. Uh, for me, what's problematic is when you get in a situation where debate is being frozen out of uh, different kinds of classrooms or legislatures imposing uh, an, an idea that you can't talk about a, a certain uh, subject, for us, Trained historians, all we do is debate. Uh, you want good debate as opposed to history is a constant no debate. debate. It's a constant it debate. It's like, I mean, it's we. I talked at the '90s, but history, literally as a profession, is built upon one generation debating with the other uh, over how do you interpret uh, what happened. And those are uh, really exciting, I think, uh, conversations to have. And we need more of that. Um, and and that's what this is trying to do. But I think broadly, um, that's. That's the kind of uh, dialogue we need to encourage on all these tough questions about the United States, both the good and the bad. And by the way, I, I, I'm a person on the left, you know, politically, but, um, but, but I, I have some criticisms that I mentioned about Howard Zinn about some views of people on the left as well. You know, some, uh, some people say in some classrooms, you know, you should never teach, you know, say a pro-slavery view. Uh, um, because that will that will trigger terrible feelings among the students, uh, and not just among African American students. And I think that's ridiculous. You know, obviously, I'm not in favor of slavery. I'm not in favor of anybody who's ever in favor of slavery. But if you don't understand why, you know, uh, millions of people thought slavery was, if not a just system, at least a necessary system, then you don't understand the Civil War, which is probably the most important thing that ever happened in American history. So uh, it's just wrong for people on the left to say there's only one history that you should really study. Uh, as it is for people on the right to say that. I think people on the left are more open to debate than many people on the right are, but uh, if they're not open to debate, then that's a problem too. I believe you already uh, touched upon this, but maybe, uh, maybe you could expound a little bit more. A uh, question from the uh, online audience asking, are there now two historical narratives, a liberal and conservative record? Um, liberal historical record? Record, yeah, like of the past, you mean, oh, of the nation, I yeah. assume. In certain quarters, yes. I mean, I guess that's what we're both in our comments pushing against. Um, and um, you don't want a record. I, I said, so this article, I mean, it's one thing to study history and, and then have certain conclusions that are political, uh, that inform your politics. I think there's nothing wrong with that. So uh, someone who spends a lot of time studying the impact of racism in this country and the struggles over civil rights, probably 
it's going to be sympathetic in 2023 uh, <laughs> to a politics that deals with these kinds of issues and takes these issues seriously. And I think um, that's a kind of narrative that makes sense, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, what's problematic is if you start with a very particular political agenda, and then you're going back and trying to read into the history and only reading into the history, those moments, those people, those ideas that fit that narrative, then you end up with what you're talking about. I do believe um, that right now that is more pervasive in conservative circles. And part of it is a lot of that history is decoupled from historians who are working on this stuff. Um, so it's, it's literally being told um, by people who want to propagate um, these kinds of narratives. And so those are two separate problems. I don't think we inevitably end up there, though. I must say, um, as someone who teaches, uh, I've taught now at three universities, as, as someone with kids uh, watching in, in high school, uh, I still think there's a lot of appetite out there uh, and a lot of space for good historical conversations that leave people not necessarily totally confused, uh, but with a messier understanding of, of how the country evolved um, or these different issues, a, a more sophisticated way to understand them. And, and I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. So uh, even though I'm a New York Jets fan, I am an optimist <laughs> by nature. Maybe that is, why, that, that is why I'm a New York Jets fan. <laughs> Uh, although I went to uh, grad school here in, in Baltimore, so I had a taste of good sports for a few years. <laughs> um, but, um, but I still think that's out there. And I, I do think I, I, we did pick historians, um, and, and many do come, I mean, most from a liberal progressive perspective, but they don't write their history that way. Um, and, and even some of the essays in the book don't reflect that. So that's what we should strive for, to ever ask the question, I think there's more of it out there, but I don't think it is uh, necessarily going to be triumphant. So we have time for two more questions, one here in the audience and one from online. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for putting together the book and contributing to it. It's, it's, it's nice to see this sort of thing out here. Um, I research uh, misinformation, disinformation, and trustworthy information over at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I'd like to ask you kind of a meta history question. Uh, a thing that I see that comes up often is this sort of tension between the um, sort of a philosophy of deciding what history is, of enforcing a narrative. And this goes very far back. I mean, you know, really these are the basis of our religious texts is how are we are going to interpret these series of events. And there is a doctrine. And on the other side, there's the exploration of information that we discover, that we uncover, that we build communally to provide greater insight and knowledge mm -hmm. and that there it doesn't seem to be a left versus right per se although they seem to line up on these sides but from a from a historical perspective how do these things reconcile over time you know technology has its own impacts on this but technology has been around since writing right i mean we've mm -hmm. seen things come and go yep. radio and fascism really are a close thing um, social media and what's going on now, kind of similar. Um, and I'd just like to hear your perspective of of sort of the history of history is how these narratives emerge or how they're controlled. Well, um, look, be, being a historian, uh, any kind of scholar is to be making choices all the time. You know, choices obviously about the subject you're going to study, choices about how to study it, choices about every damn sentence you're writing and how to um, use the facts to um, interest people. You know, um, and um, I think all historians, whatever their, you know, political views, ideological views, do that. Um, but, you know, what is important uh, as fact changes too, as you know. I mean, there's a historicity of, uh, of facts themselves. Uh, for example, I have a, a colleague, John McNeil, a very great environmental historian, uh, who basically studies um, nature, you know, uh, and, and uses technology to figure out what civilizations looked like uh, 2,000 years ago, as well as 400 years ago, uh, using all these new technologies, you know. And 100 years ago, even 10, 15, 20 years ago, those were not facts that people even knew existed, for example. So, you know, that's not really, I don't have any great answer to your question, but all I know is methodologically, 
Um, one of the great things about history is that it's so wide open. You know, I, I used to joke with my grad students that there can be history of everything, even the history of napkins. And then he, and one grad student came to me one day with three books on the history of napkins. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. It wasn't a joke. You know? right. Uh, about civility and dining and, you know, aristocratic uh, mores and everything else, you know. Um, so I don't know, that's just I mean, you know, yeah. reflections. You know? No, no, the history and napkins, uh, that's a good <laughs> one. Um, I mean, the way I think about it, I had a moment in college, I went to Brandeis University for college and my first year I took a lot of history class. I liked it already, but a lot of what I was doing, I was just trying to remember everything. I was trying to remember everything, you know, European history, everything, every war the sequence of presidencies and all of that, which was important to get a hold of. And then I had this professor, I'll never forget, his name was David Hackett Fisher. Oh, yeah. um, and he, he taught uh, many great courses and he would meet with every student for like a half hour, an hour a week. Everyone in these big lectures, he believed that he'd grill you. And you'd sit in his office and, and I took a class with him on the Civil War and Reconstruction. And we had read a series of books on the Civil War, I remember. Um, different interpretations. And I kind of understood that, but I was not, I, you know, so you're whatever, 19, that wasn't my main thing. Sat down in his office, I sat in the chair nervous. He puts his feet up on the chair, there's sunlight right in your face. I think it was intentional. <laughs> and he's like, tell me about the historiography of uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction. I had no idea what historiography was, couldn't even guess. And I didn't want to say that though. I'm sitting there trying to like figure out what that might have been. And gradually in that conversation over the course of the semester, I learned what it meant. And it meant, uh, A, there is this task of getting facts, of thinking of what are facts we're not looking at and finding all the facts. But then there's this other thing historians do all the time. It's this endless debate about what do you make of those facts? What do you make of those moments? And that becomes a debate that isn't, we don't run away from it. That is what we do. We literally do that. And you, in the challenge, in the heat of that conversation, you learn a little more. You never get a definitive answer because one day you'll be debunked too. Um, but if you're doing it well, it's something solid that becomes the basis of the debate. And that's the difference, I think, in those two realms that you're talking about. And it's important to have that, that kind of conversation. And that's different than what the question was earlier about straight narratives based on liberal versus conservative. Um, but when I learned that in college, it opened up how I thought of this field, how I understood what studying history really is. And that's what we really uh, can use a, a lot of. And, and that should never end. And that shouldn't be seen as something that's bad. And by the way, just, just one quick comment. Um, you know, a lot of times you hear people, unfortunately, on the right mostly say, you know, you're teaching revisionist history. You know, this right. revisionist history as if, you know, history is like the Ten Commandments or something, that there's only one set of facts and they must be adhered to uh, at every point. Um, and of course, all good history is revisionist history. Because what's the point of writing exactly what right. someone has already written? I mean, don't waste your time, you know. Uh, do something else with your life. <laughs> um, uh, there's a great anecdote. I just read a very great historian of the Civil War Reconstruction, Eric Foner. Um, I just read today, actually, uh, uh, he was asked at one point, you know, who, who was the first revisionist historian? And he thought he was making a joke. He said, uh, Her Herodotus. You know who Herodotus was, the great classical Greek historian? And the journalist said, oh, I never heard that guy before. Would you put me in touch with him? <laughs> That's really um, so, you know, um, you know what, these, these essays yeah. on these very topics would be written very differently 30, 40 years ago. And of course, that is what keeps history alive. You know, if that wasn't true, uh, then Julie and I would be doing something else. There's a there's a terrific essay in here on America overseas, and uh, basically, a historian takes uh, on the idea that there is no U.S. imperialism. It's not part of immoral, our history. Yeah. And one of the th he's not challenging kind of the facts of some that we we don't kind of have massive swaths of territorial control. In, in a traditional imperial way, but he says, if you ask the question differently, how can a country assert control through proxy governments, through resource influence, then you have a very different history of what the US has done in the 20th century. That's a historiographical debate. He writes it beautifully in a way that's, again, very accessible, but that's how you can kind of shift the term, shift the conversation, take real facts and real history 
but then say, we can interpret this very differently. And you see the reach the US has had in parts of the world like Central America. So that's, that's what you get when it's done well, I think. You had another question? Thank you. Yeah, we're going to sum up everything tonight uh, with this final question from the audience online. Uh, probably the most difficult question. Uh, besides your own work, can you each recommend a book on American history that everyone should read? Yeah, I could. Just I could, one, huh? <laughs> Again, the most difficult question this evening. Well, any of Michael's books I would recommend. I'll start with that. Uh, but Same, new, any, any of his books. Uh, I just read a new book. Uh, we were just talking about it. The new biography of uh, J. Edgar Hoover by Beverly Gage, which is really... I think it's a terrific book um, that makes you, again, the facts of his life are, um, oh, there you are. The facts of his life are what we knew, but she, uh, she adds, she adds stories about how he amassed power. She adds stories about how the director of the FBI uh, strategically built up this institution. And she, you know, the traditional story, this is just a quick way to think about it, is he basically had bad stuff on politicians, so no politician wanted to touch him. And she says, well, the FBI was also enormously popular before the 1970s, as he was in film, in television, and in books. And that gave the agency a kind of clout that was immense, whoever was president. Uh, and, and, and it's a very good book. So that's a new book that I just read that I think people find interesting, incredibly well-written, and does some of the kind of work through a biography that we've been talking about tonight. I'll just name another biography, uh, which is one of the Pulitzer Prize, so it's not obscure, uh, but uh, David Blight's biography of Frederick Douglass, um, which uh, Frederick Douglass is now, you know, pretty well known, you know, figure. Uh, I think Donald Trump said he's been, he's been talked about more and more, right? <laughs> as if he was still alive. Um, but Frederick Douglass, of course, born in Maryland, as, as uh, you probably know, uh, escaped from Baltimore, uh, got, got his freedom on the Baltimore Harbor. Uh, escaping to the north um, uh, at a young age. Um, and David Blight's book about him is, is wonderful because it, he obviously admires Douglas. Uh, how can you not for what he did? But also he realized that Douglas was a very much a creature of his time. He, was, uh, he, he believed in what some people would call now respectability politics, you know, that uh, you know, black people should not just talk about racism, but should rise, you know, lift themselves up you know, uh, in various ways to start businesses. Uh, he believed in some ways kind of social Darwinism at times that people got to the top, you know, as long as they were free individuals were, were uh, you know, probably supposed to be there. So he, he complicates the life of someone who is, you know, I think one of the greatest Americans who ever lived, but he doesn't, you know, put him on a pedestal and, and make him out to be a hero who had no warts, you know, um, from our point of view today. Uh, he understood him as historians have to do as an historical personality. And, you know, um, the famous phrase, the past is a foreign country, you know, um, people lived differently then. People thought differently then, even though uh, Frederick Douglass, you know, uh, died um, only 125 years ago, 127 years ago. Nevertheless, he was a creature of the 19th century. And, uh, and Blight really brings out that all, out in all its complexity, all its contradictions and all its, uh, uh, and all its greatness as well. I want to thank Julian and Michael for this illuminating hour. Thanks for coming to the Pratt this evening. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. having us here. Really nice to be thanks, here. Thanks for your great questions. Yeah. We'll um, be out there in Zoom land as yes. well. We're going to uh, move on to the signing portion. So uh, through those doors, the Ivy Bookstore is here. Both recommendations were great, but most importantly, Myth America on sale today, <laughs> right outside the door. Get a book, get it signed. Thanks for coming out. Yeah.